register to attend a unique conference at the world-famous Ark Encounter, organized by the Wisdom Pearl. AI and the Days of Noah will address today's relevant topics such as evidence for the authenticity of the Bible, artificial intelligence, liberty of conscience, CBDCs, climate change, the sanctuary, importance of rest, Bible prophecies through the lens of the scriptures. Visit thewisdompearl.org. Registration includes a ticket to the Ark Encounter Museum. Our speakers include Ken Ham, the founder of Ark Encounter, Pastor Ron Kelly, Eva Tompkins, Dr. Monet St. Juicy, Dr. Calvin Beisner, and many others. Separate programs for kids and teens. You don't want to miss this opportunity. Visit thewisdompearl.org. We will see you at the State of the Art Answers Center Auditorium on September 13th and 14th. What do you think? Do, uh, is, are the brains of women, are they wired differently than men in terms of perceiving dangers and threats? So we have given two different abilities. Both are needed. You need Jesus. Because sometimes I have to say that. Sometimes I've given you just as much as I can give you as far as principle is concerned, and we need to have a talk. When he was referred to me, he had had a massive heart attack in his 30s. But the context of the heart attack is it occurred right as he watched his father kill his mother and then his father kill himself, right in front of him. And that's where the Holy Spirit and God speaks through us, through the frontal cortex, as a tree of good and evil, you know, because that's wisdom. Wisdom is not only knowing what is good for us, but what is not good for us. <laughs> How important are women for healthcare decisions in the family? Well, I believe that God wants to use women in a very special way because women were the first to fall in the Garden of Eden. And so I think that God has specifically wants to restore the woman so that she can be a powerful tool to help the family to nurture them and, um, with God's original intent. Um, because we were lured away by our own deceptions. And I think that when we are nurturing with our instinctive side that God has given us and we use that with our focus on Christ, then he can really use us as a powerful tool to restore the man to help to build him up um, the way that he created him to be and also to influence the children. In the health freedom movement, of which probably everybody here could, could consider themselves part of the, the movement, in general, is it more women than men? I would say it's more women than men. What do people think? More women than men in, in health freedom? Why is that? Why is that? Why are women, why do women have their radar up to a greater extent than men do when there's an issue with respect to safety? Well, I think that women have more um, of a holistic right brain um, approach than men do. We're more in tune to our right brain side. And so we're able to sense things a little deeper in our atmosphere um, when it comes to emotion. So that's... That's a good analysis. Sam, what do you think? Do, uh, is, are the brains of women, are they wired differently than men in terms of perceiving dangers and threats? It's a very interesting question. So uh, we uh, have you wondered why men drive most semis, big trucks, uh, most of them are pilots, mostly in the terrestrial uh, communication of, you know, um, of vehicles are men. Anybody? Well, that's an inherent anatomy of how the retinal information come, that comes from the eyes and expresses in the brain. 
So it's just, a spa we call it a spatial navigation. It's better in men, just because of the nature of the ganglionic cells in the eyes. But women tend to integrate better information when it comes to the whole aspect of the vision. So those are the differences. And when it comes to awareness, well, think about this. <clears throat> As men are doers, and we, you've seen men uh, constructing these high rises, like New York, and there are pictures of men way up there. Would you ladies care to be up there? There's the answer. So we have given two different abilities. Both are needed. And there's, the, <laughs> there's pretty much the explanation. Yeah, I mean, I think about it this way. You know, go back a couple thousand years, and you're in a, you're in a walled city in Europe, and, and you know, you're being attacked by marauders. You know, the men go out there to, to battle, and the women are protecting the children. They're trying to keep things uh, together, trying to keep that unit together. I think women in, invariably have a greater sense of awareness with a potential threat. And I can tell you clearly with these vaccines, women see it much more easily than men. Men seem to be in a trance. They're just, you know, I need to do it for my job. I will do it for my job. And women are like, no, no, they, you know, this is... And so I, I sense it, um, I sense a, a great difference. Denitra, how do you, when you are working with a, a family, how do you actually introduce faith in this professional interchange that you're having? How, how do you do it? Well, most of my clients that do come to me are have a faith-based perspective because I specifically... Um, market myself as a Christian-based therapist. So most of them, I don't introduce Christ to them. They already have an influence towards, towards Christianity. Sam, are there problems in doing this? If you are engaged in a professional relationship as a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, is there a problem? Is there a line that's being crossed if one goes into the spiritual realm? So I'm trying to understand the question, is this with anyone? There is a word that we use and that we need to gain from our mothers. It's called intuition. How many of you have deemed your mothers, especially when they're aged, my mother can read me like no one can? So that intuition, I think we need to exercise it. There is um, there's something about listening. So when we introduce ourselves to interact with somebody, I think the best thing is say, hey, hello, I'm so-and-so. And then pause and then wait for them to engage you. And the few words can be very telling and then informative about what is that person up to or after. We cannot answer all questions, but we can engage them. And sometimes it takes a long time, doesn't it? Especially between uh, men and women. Men are, we're a little more difficult to gain information from if we have already preconceived ideas. Ladies may or may not, but then they start opening up, oh yes, and there's always um, um, a theme. So the bottom line from either males or females is to find the interest in the person, and that would open doors. For us, Seven Day of Venice's haystacks. You know that, right? So. And one thing I usually do is if I notice that someone doesn't have, because every now and then someone will come to me that's not a Christian, and if I notice that they're not, I do. you can still give the principle. Um, without necessarily giving a direct approach if they're not ready to receive that. And I can pretty much get in uh, a gauge if they are ready to, for me to say, you know what, you need Jesus. Because sometimes I have to say that. Sometimes I've given you just as much as I can give you as far as principle is concerned, and we need to have a talk. Because you may not want to see me no anymore after I let you know that I don't have any more to give you but Christ. And if you don't, if we don't pull Jesus into this, this is just not going to work because there's only so far you can go before you're not going to be able to get any more support. You can do all of the coping mechanisms in the world, 
But if we don't incorporate Jesus into this, specifically Jesus, not any other religion, specifically Jesus, you're not going to get healed. And there are times where I do have to have those conversations and my client who isn't necessarily deeply faith driven, they may have an idea of God. They'll say, you know what? You're right. And they'll start, I'll start going forward. I've had a client who came out of pornography because we started really just incorporating and going full throttle with incorporating the spiritual aspect. I've had several clients that have just reversed their negative thinking as a result of us really going deep with incorporating who Jesus is, getting a deep understanding of who he is, and how do we incorporate our faith into our mental health. Wow, great answers. Great answers. You know what you, know what you made me think of, Denitra, when you were giving that answer? You made me think of a patient who was referred to me, young man in his 30s, and I was tipped off of what happened. So I knew what happened, but he didn't know that I knew, and he was referred to me. He had had a massive heart attack in his 30s. But the context of the heart attack is it occurred right as he watched his father kill his mother and then his father kill himself right in front of him. Do you know that that patient who I had for a long time never told me that vignette of the context in which he had a heart attack? He never volunteered it. Now, I knew it, and in the, I wouldn't say over the course of time, we are effective because I engaged people like you, and I engaged other healthcare professionals. And what I learned as an MD doctor is, I can't field all the different specialties that I need help. We need to work as a team. And he actually worked with a mind-body specialist. I really think it was the psychological trauma of watching that is what triggered the heart attack. I honestly believe that. And specialists who worked in the field of psychology agreed. But to this day, he's actually never came forward. Dr. McCullough, you know, I've got to tell you, you know, there was a... a you know, homicide, suicide, right in front of me, that trigger. To this day, this is more than a decade later, it, it, it's, just, it's just the way I think the human brain works. It, is it true, Sam, that the human brain can be like a clam and just close up like that and just see, try to seal off trauma like that? Yes, Sam. Absolutely. We uh, are made of experiences. For instance, uh, this experience right now is producing some uh, neuroplasticity in us because we're connecting with the prefrontal cortex. Uh, I deem the prefrontal cortex uh, the tree of knowledge. Remember the tree that was planted and the Garden of Eden? That is a prefrontal cortex. It is there for our knowledge. And so right now we're absorbing this experience and hopefully this experience means to us, we take, when, we, when we leave, brings some meaning to us in a way that we can enhance what we already know. Because when we hear people such as yourself, my friend here and the other panelists and people that come with ex this rich experiences and their training, I hope that we are consolidating and engaging our prefrontal cortex to make sense of that message. And that's where the Holy Spirit and God is, speaks through us, through the front, frontal cortex, as a tree of good and evil, you know, because that's wisdom. Wisdom is not only knowing what is good for us, but what is not good for us. That is wisdom. And I believe that we need to exercise that with uh, healthy living, good habits, put our brains to rest. Um I can go on and on, and I, I know there's some questions on, on, on adjustments and um, neuroprotectants, which is part of my research, and, to, uh, and then we can measure that in the brain function. All those things are very important, and so this is one such an experience. I wish we can have this all the time. I think you're working on it, Raj, uh, because meetings such as this are super important to connect the knowledge that comes from God through the Bible and also the, uh, the knowledge that we have acquired through our education and experiences. I just wanted to piggyback on what Dr. Sam said, that when we are 
exposed to trauma and emotional pain, it ignites a fear response. And that fear response is stored in our amygdala. It's called an amygdala hijack. So your brain literally gets hijacked by this traumatic experience and it's un you're unable to think with your prefrontal cortex. And the way that we come out of that amygdala hijack is we go from the downstairs to upstairs because our amygdala is our lower nature. We gotta go from our lower nature up to our upper nature. And one of the things that you do is you attach words to what it is that you're feeling. So if I'm feeling some sort of anxiety or some sort of depression, I start attaching words to that thing. I start saying, I usually I start writing. That's what I start doing because when you write, you combine, when you write, pray, read your word, you're combining both hemispheres together. And that's when the Holy Spirit can start to work and it knocks you back into your prefrontal cortex, which is your rational part of your brain. So I'll usually start writing and I'll start asking God, why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? Because God is, was our creator. He can be our recreator. Whatever it is that we're feeling, he can take exactly where it's coming from. He knows. We don't know because we're stuck in an amygdala hijack, but he knows. And if you just continue to ask him, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? He can, he can reveal what it is. And sometimes it's generational. Sometimes it can even start with you. Sometimes it goes back to your mother's mother. Sometimes it's something that happened in the womb. And so the Lord can it reveal exactly where this thing started so that we can stop the pattern of behavior. Wow, that's, those are great answers. It, it brings up this whole issue, Sam. I wanted to ask you, what is emotional intelligence? When people use that word, what do they mean? I say a lot of question because... <laughs> I mean, I was, I was listening to your, to your story last night, um, Dana, and I was listening to the young lady, the daughter there singing it be beautifully, as well as the young lady in the back sing. They were singing with emotional intelligence. They were talking with emotional, emotional intelligence. I hope that we are speaking to you with emotional intelligence. And... That's where we need to be really mindful of this. Emotional intelligence, to answer your question, is a consolidation of experience uh, uh, and the process of every cortical area of the brain. And to detach ourselves from me, 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 it's all about me, and turn it over to there you are. What about you? And that is the bottom line. Emotional intelligence is more about others than me. And that's the best answer I can come up with. Well, I'm, in order to understand emotional intelligence, we first have to understand attachment disorder. Yeah. Because when we understand attachment disorder, we can know where we fall on the spectrum. So I usually start out when it comes to attachment disorder that everybody's at a deficit. We all have attachment disorder because we are detached from God during the fall. And the way that we get from under this infection is that we have to first connect with the Lord. And when we connect with the Lord, he, help us to under he helps us to understand our internal working model. Your internal working model is how you see yourself, how you see others, and how you see God. And unfortunately, because of the fall, we come in at a deficit and we come in with all these negative messages about who we are, about others, and about God based on whatever our parents have passed down to us because they didn't know any better. And so we have to start to work through those issues. If you have a very secure mother, if you have a very secure father, then you will have a higher, greater level of emotion. You will start out with a higher, greater level of emotional intelligence. But if you come into the world and you have trauma, emotional pain, then you have a lot more you have to work through and that will affect your, your level of emotional intelligence. How you see others, how you relate to others, how you relate in relationships, how you see your own, understanding of your value and your self-image, and then what your thoughts are about God. Does God love me? 
Does he see me? Does he understand me? Does he think I'm valuable? All those core needs are, are needs that our parents are supposed to meet early in childhood, but if they don't meet them right, then we get all messed up and we don't know how to relate to each other as adults. How early in terms of age? It starts out in the womb. Within three days of conception, the baby is in the womb trying to figure out where they fit. Wow. Three days of conception, studies show. So it's very important that we understand that this does not just you know, start in adulthood. It starts as little as babyhood, and we have to go back. It's very important to go back, but we can do it with God. We don't have to... Um, we can do it with God from a biblical perspective, and he can show, you, show us all those mixed messages and those insecurities that we came under as children. Do you know, um, you've always heard the term colicky baby. Do you know colicky babies are almost always first babies? You know that? Really? You were one? Why is that? Why are colicky babies, well, why is the fifth baby never colicky? Why? There you go, right? So colicky baby could be rookie parent syndrome. The babies are constantly uh, surveilling and saying, listen, am I okay? Am I okay? And the parents are like, well, I don't know. And the baby goes, well, I don't know either. And then the next thing you know, the, the crying just stops uh, nonstop. Yeah, so just what you're saying, uh, that in fact we're constantly, you know, reading each other. We're constantly interacting, and, and, and then we internalize things. So, Sam, I want to ask you. Why is it, let me ask people in the crowd, have you ever gotten into an argument with somebody and really has gone too far and that night you can't sleep? Have you ever had that? You cannot sleep. You, for, you, you, for the life of you, you cannot sleep. Sam, why is that? How, how, can, how can we just, how can something like an argument prevent us from sleeping like for three days? How does that work? <laughs> I'm smiling because I am not a behavioralist. I'm, I'm a neuroscientist, and, and we're not answering. You know, I'm, I'm glad, though, because I wish, I'm, I'm wishing I, I'm answering with insight based on the physiology that I know well. I believe that the brain ruminates when it's about, again, emotional intelligence. We're going back to the same thing. It's not about engaging the HPA axis, you know, the stress response, we're still going to have norepinephrine circulating in our veins, in our, um, in our circulatory system. Um, that may or may not affect the, the heart rhythm because of age. But in some of us that are past certain threshold, you could tell this, we get more affected. It's like, you know, a, 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 a lady in her 30s versus a young lady in a, in, who's 18 getting on the bike and pedaling for about a mile. So it affects us more the, the, the more we age. But besides that point, here we go again. If we engage that emotional intelligence through the prefrontal cortex, it is there for a reason. We need to take a breather and say, okay, let's analyze this a little bit. I hope that if we engage the prefrontal cortex, I think we'll go to sleep within an hour as opposed to not doing it. Because if we don't have that part of the brain ex uh, exercised, now is like, how dare she or he spoke to me like this? I can't believe it. See, that extends to 20 more minutes, 40 minutes. I can't believe that nobody understands me. That's another hour. Who knows? And then we go like, why does this happen again? Now we go into the victimhood. That's two hours. And all of a sudden, it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m., oh, I got to go, and then we fall asleep out of being exhausted to wake up again at 5 or 6, whenever, whichever time we need to wake up. If that is happening to us, not good. <laughs> it's happened to me when I was younger. It still happens sometimes, but you know what? We Christians have an advantage. We can kneel and say, God, forgive me. Please forgive me. Help me understand I want to engage my prefrontal cortex to make sense of this. I am not happy, and that's, that's good. We have to acknowledge our emotions, right? Uh, and counseling, um, she can tell you, you must acknowledge your part and go through that and then ask God for guidance. Hopefully, then we can fall asleep. And that's, I can tell you, personally, 
I have experienced pressures. I have experienced uh, challenges. I pause and I go, okay, Lord, I need to sleep. I need to get up early. Please help me to forget this. And he, he's done it more, more often than not. I don't know how and why he knows that I'm sincere, <laughs> that I really, really want to work through this. And he's done it. That's my personal take on this. Wow, that was such a great answer. You know, we're going to have to close this panel, but uh, we're going to end on that strong note. God's got this, right? I love it. Thank you so much. Denitra, Sam, thank you. Hello, world. Register for the AI and the Days of Noah conference held at the world-famous Ark Encounter. Visit thewisdompearl.org for the details.